Yahweh, our Father in heaven above, we come before you now in prayer, thanking you for this year past you have given us and the prospect of a new year, a new year in which to serve you. So we seek to finish our year by considering your son and the lives of those who he impacted and how he can impact our lives. So help us to open our hearts and our minds to consider what your word tells us and to grow in faith and in understanding. We are blessed by the companionship, the safety and the freedoms we can enjoy in this country and we thank you for allowing us to meet together. Yet we consider those who are struggling, who can't be with us, who feel the weight of life and mortality bearing down on them. Be with them, guide them and strengthen them, those who find the way hard. Yet, O oh Father, we know that the only thing that can certainly change our mortality is the return of your Son. And we pray most of all that this evening may be interrupted by his return, that he may come back even, even tonight if it is your will. We pray all of these things through his name, our Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. <clears throat> As an introduction to Brother Nathan's talks, we'll read together Isaiah 53, and I'll invite Brother Isaac Armonis to come forward and read that, after which he comes straight up. <clears throat> Isaiah 53. Who hath believed our report? And to whom is the arm of Yahweh revealed? For he shall grow up before him as a tender plant and as a root out of a dry ground. He hath no form nor comeliness. And when we shall see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. He is despised and rejected of men, a man of sorrows and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, <clears throat> smitten of God, and afflicted. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. The chastisement of our peace was upon him, and with his stripes we are healed. All we, like sheep, have gone astray. We have turned every one to his own way, and Yahweh hath laid on him the iniquity of us all. He was oppressed and he was afflicted, yet he opened not his mouth. He is brought as a lamb to the slaughter, and as a sheep before her shearers is dumb, so he openeth not his mouth. He was taken from prison and from judgment, and who shall declare his generation? For he was cut off out of the land of the living. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. And he made his grave with the wicked and with the rich in his death, because he had done no violence, neither was any deceit in his mouth. Yet it pleased Yahweh to bruise him. He hath put him to grief. When thou shalt make his soul an offering for sin, he shall see his seed, he shall prolong his days, and the pleasure of Yahweh shall prosper in his hand. He shall see the travail of his soul, and shall be satisfied. By his knowledge shall my righteous servant justify many, for he shall bear their iniquities. Therefore will I divide him a portion with the great, and he shall divide the spoil with the strong because he hath poured out his soul unto death, and he was numbered with the transgressors, and he bare the sin of many, and he made intercession for the transgressors.
Well, good evening, uh, brothers and sisters, and my very dear fellow young people. It's uh, amazing to be back here and to be COVID free. I hear last year was uh, somewhat interrupted. So hopefully we can share an amazing week together, looking at the incredible character of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's no better subject, is there, than our master and the way in which he was able to touch people's lives. And as you may have guessed from the title of our series this week, we want to concentrate together on the occasions where our Lord Jesus Christ physically reached out and touched people. People who were without help, without hope, without wholeness. People whose lives were changed forever, transformed by the simple touch of a man in whose fingertips was vested the power of the universe. And I'd like you to come as we start tonight to Luke chapter 11, as we consider the hands of our Savior and the power that exuded from his fingertips. Luke chapter 11, our Lord Jesus Christ was healing and casting out demons. And of course, the leaders didn't believe on him. And we read in Luke 11 verse 19 these words, And if I, by Beelzebub, Christ said, cast out demons, by whom do your sons cast them out? Therefore shall they be your judges. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out demons, no doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. You remember from the story of the ten plagues in Exodus, the occasion when Janice and Jambres, who were Pharaoh's magicians, were utterly confounded by the miracles that Moses seemed to be able to bring about by just a, an effortless wave of his rod. And they exclaimed in Exodus chapter 8 and verse 19, it's in the margin, this is the finger of God. The things that Moses could do were so unbelievable, so unexplainable that they had to be divine. Maybe the first couple of plagues were explainable by Egyptian trickery, cloaks and mirrors. Maybe it was an algal bloom that spread across the Nile Delta. And the frogs jumped out of the river because of that. But by the time it came to the lice, young people, it was undeniable. Even Pharaoh's best magicians were dumbfounded. The hand of God was undoubtedly at work. And our Lord, in Luke chapter 11 and verse 20, is going to quote Pharaoh's magicians, Jannies and Jambres from Exodus 8 and verse 19. But if I, with the finger of God, cast out demons... No doubt the kingdom of God is come upon you. So this series that we want to consider this week together is about the indisputable, undeniable power of the God of the universe who chose to give to his only beloved son enormous, unparalleled power to pour it without measure into his upturned palms, the power to raise the dead, the power to cure the lame and the blind, to restore severed ears and withered hands, heal diseases that no one even thought was possible. The power that flowed from this man's fingertips was irrefutable. But just as Pharaoh confronted with the finger of God himself, could not bring himself to believe the leaders in the time of Christ, the devout teachers of the law, were every bit as obstinate as the Egyptian pharaoh. And there's a contrast in this chapter between two sets of fingers. Look what it says in verse 46. Verse 46 of the same chapter, Luke chapter 11. And he said, Woe unto you also, ye lawyers, for ye laid men with burdens grievous to be borne, and ye yourselves touch not the burdens with one of your fingers. Do you know that the word finger or fingers only occurs eight times in the New Testament and twice in this chapter? It has to be a contrast, doesn't it? One set of fingers, verse 20, only sought to heal, to help, to alleviate burdens. The other set of fingers, verse 46, 
was entirely the opposite. They were so completely absorbed in themselves. They were immune to the hand of God in their midst. Hands that could cure them of even their stubbornness. But they couldn't even see what was in front of them. It was the finger of God amongst them. And just as the finger of God, you'll remember in Exodus 31 and verse 18, reached out and inscribed the Ten Commandments on those stone tablets to teach the people. Now the finger of God in the person of Jesus Christ is going to work countless miracles throughout the land of Israel to teach his people the same lessons. And he was amongst them for three and a half years. Everywhere he went, the leaders stubbornly refused to believe the finger of God in the nation. But to everybody else, they were astonished, astounded, excited by the miracles wrought by this man's hands and the people whose lives were forever changed. This series is the story of the people who were touched by the master's hand. Now, I want to start tonight with a poem which some of you may have heard of before, but it expresses poetically what we want to look at this week together, albeit in a Christian way, so you'll excuse a slight Christian nuance. It's called The Touch of the Master's Hand. "'Twas battered and scarred, and the auctioneer thought it scarcely worth his while to waste much time on the old violin, but held it up with a smile. "'What am I bidding, good folks?' he cried. "'Who'll start the bidding for me? A dollar? A dollar. Then two. Only two? Two dollars. And who'll make it three? Three dollars. Once. Three dollars twice. Going for three. But no. From the room, far back, a grey-haired man came forward and picked up the bow. Then, wiping the dust from the old violin and tightening the loosened strings, he played a melody pure and sweet as a caroling angel sings. The music ceased and the auctioneer with a voice that was quiet and low said what am i bid for the old violin and he held it up with the bow a thousand dollars and who'll make it two two thousand and who will make it three three thousand once three thousand twice and going and gone said he the people cheered, but some of them cried, we do not quite understand what changed its worth. Swift came the reply, the touch of the master's hand. And many a man with his life out of tune, battered and scarred with sin, is auctioned cheap to the thoughtless crowd much like the old violin. A mess of pottage, a glass of wine, again, and he carries on. He's going once and going twice. He's going and almost gone. But the master comes. And the foolish crowd never can quite understand the worth of a soul and the change that is wrought by the touch of the master's hand. Do you know we're told in 1st of Timothy 1 and verse 15 that this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation, that our Lord Jesus Christ came into this world, young people, to save sinners. He came, young people, to the battered, to the scarred, to the people whose lives were out of tune, to the weak, to the helpless, to the despised, to the underprivileged, to the desperate, to the forgotten. And he offered to those people the hand of the Almighty, the touch of spirit power 
the finger of God. And if we feel a little out of tune, brothers and sisters and young people, a little or a lot scarred by sin, maybe lost in the crowds, then brothers and sisters and young people, this man that we want to consider this week together is for us. His compassion, his empathy, his understanding reach down the decades of time and can touch us just as they did in days of old. And tonight we want to take a class just to consider this subject, the importance of touch. Do you know, touch is a very interesting sense. All the five main senses, sight, smell, hearing, taste, and touch are all important. And none of us, would we, would want to be without any of them. But it's also true to say that actually there are many people who have limited taste or smell who lead very normal lives. And there are very many people who were maybe born deaf or blind, but also managed to, uh, to manage in life tolerably well. But touch is the one sense that we always take for granted, and yet touch is essential for life. It's the first sense to develop, and it's the last sense to fade. And more than any other sense, we use it to connect to each other. Our skin is, after all, our biggest organ. Now, you may have seen or heard of this study. It was done in the United States in 1944, in the war years. And they took 40 newborn infants, probably orphans, who were housed in a special facility, and these orphans or children were barely touched or talked to for the first formative weeks and months of their lives in an experiment to see how they developed without human affection and touch. Seems kind of cruel now, doesn't it? But do you know what the results of the study were? Well, we'll never know. Because the study had to be abandoned after just four months. Because over half of the 40 babies died. Perfectly healthy before, but half of them gave up on living in just 16 weeks because they were never touched. They never connected. They never belonged. A lack of physical touch is toxic to life itself. And in actual fact, the same experiment was done back in the 13th century by German King Frederick II, and in his experiment, all the babies died. It was a tragic study, but it illustrates an incredible lesson. Both of these studies demonstrate what touch is all about. It is connection and belonging. It's essential. And we know this for ourselves, don't we, from the experience of COVID in the last two or three years. We very quickly become disconnected when we can't physically interact with each other. It's just not the same on Zoom. And we need that real connection and belonging that comes from being amongst each other. That's why, you know, putting virtual goggles on and sitting on the couch all by yourself, existing in some metaverse, is just doomed to failure. We have an existential need to be around each other. And our master knew that this was so, the importance of touch and how to use it to save. Now, it's interesting as we start looking at this subject together this week, that the Gospels invest a very a large emphasis on the hands of our Lord Jesus Christ. Now, I'm not sure if you've ever thought about what the hands of Jesus Christ might have been like. But here's what Harry Whitaker says in his book, Bible Studies, on page 8. It's difficult to believe that they were elegant, soft, well-manicured hands, the hands of an artist or a musician. For had he not spent long years as a carpenter in Joseph's workshop? No, these were rough, sinewy hands, immediately proclaiming their owner to be an artisan. But what they were like is quite unimportant. It is what 
they did that matters. And whilst this last comment may be true, when we pause just for a minute to think about the hands of our master, these are hands that have seen hard work, aren't they? And poverty. Hands that were scarred and battered themselves with making quality furniture, yokes, doors in Nazareth, chiseling and shaping and carrying stone, carpenter's hands that had ample experience of blisters, splinters, torn fingernails, hands that sympathized with the people, hands that symbolized their lives of hardship, hands that reached out in empathy and understanding to their need. And in the gospel records, there's going to be a marked emphasis on the hands of our master. We read in in Mark chapter 6 and verse 2, mighty works were wrought by his hands. Now these are all the mentions of the hand or hands of Jesus Christ in the gospels. Now we know that he reached out and touched on a number of other occasions, but this is how the gospel records portray the hands of Jesus Christ, healing people, bringing miracles and blessing, blessing children. These are hands that are incredibly used for others. And there's something remarkable about this list. As you just cast your eyes down that list, you will find that every single time the hands of Christ are specifically mentioned, they are to help someone else, to heal, to comfort, to lift up, to bless. This is a subject where we cannot but be impressed by the giving and caring nature of our master. Never once, young people, did he use the finger of God for himself. It was only ever always for others. And it's clear from the gospel records that he was always touching people or being touched. Have a look at this emphasis in Mark's gospel. Just a few quotations just from Mark's gospel, the gospel of the servant. These are servants' hands. For he had healed many, Mark chapter 3 says, insomuch that they pressed upon him for to touch him, as many as had plagues. A couple of chapters later, for she said, if I may touch but his clothes, I shall be whole. Mark chapter 6, whithersoever he entered into villages or cities or country, they laid the sick in the streets and besought him that they might touch, if it were, but the border of his garment, and as many as touched him were made whole. Mark chapter 8, and he cometh to Bethsaida, and they bring a blind blind man to him, and besought him to touch him. It's clear, isn't it, that touch was a vital part of the ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ. So often he was thronged by the multitude, sometimes thousands Thousands of people. One occasion, he had to jump into a boat and get away from the land because he was afraid his disciples would be crushed to death. That's how many were in the crowds. Constantly touching people and being touched by them was an integral part of his experience, his mission. Sometimes it was the crowds jostling him, but often he consciously reaches out to touch others by choice. And that brings us to a very interesting question as we consider the subject of touch in the Gospels. And that is this. Why is there an emphasis in the Gospel records on Christ's hands reaching out to touch when we know for sure that touching people was not necessary to heal them? You know, we're going to come to this chapter tomorrow, but come very quickly to uh, Matthew chapter 8. We know that Christ didn't need to touch people to heal them. And sandwiched in Matthew chapter 8, between two healings where Christ definitely touched people, the leper in verse 3, and Peter's wife's mother in verse 15, we're going to have the story of the centurion and his servant. And look what we read in verses 8 to 10. The centurion answered and said, Lord, 
I am not worthy that thou shouldest come under my roof, but speak the word only, and my servant shall be healed, for I am a man under authority, having soldiers under me, and I say to this man, go, and he goeth, and to another, come, and he cometh, and to my servant, do this, and he doeth it. When Jesus heard it, he marveled and said to them that followed, Verily I say unto you, I have not found so great faith, no, not in Israel. And he healed the man's servant from afar. Touch was unnecessary for this man who had the spirit of the Almighty without measure. He could heal from afar just as effectively as he could from up close. Distance or location were no impediment to his powers. And yet, many, many times, he chose to reach out and touch. Why did our master choose to reach out and touch when he never had to? Well, maybe we can understand a little bit better the, see, the reason for that question or the answer to that question when we understand the significance of touch in the scriptures. And in actual fact, there's four main ways in which touch is used in the scriptures of truth. The Bible talks about a touch that could contaminate. That's the first way in which touch is used, isn't it? It's there right back in Genesis chapter 3. Eve said, I can't even touch the fruit lest I die. We won't go to any of these passages, but just let me highlight for you, by way of illustration, the ones in green. Numbers 16 and verse 26. You'll remember, it's the story of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram. And Moses said, Depart, I pray you, from the tents of these wicked men, and touch nothing of theirs, lest ye be consumed in all their sins. Touching their things brought contamination and uncleanness. So when Christ chose to touch, to reach out his hands and make deliberate physical contact, it was a way of showing that he was more powerful than the law where touch could only defile. Amazingly, he could reach out and touch and not be contaminated because every time he touched a dead body or somebody who was unclean, they were instantly healed or came back to life. No one could say, could they, that this man was contaminated or defiled by touching the unclean because he never did. Cleanness happened beneath his fingertips. This man was totally different from the law, above the law. Instead of receiving contamination, he brought cleansing. Well, the second way in which touch is used in the scriptures is to connect. You will remember Esther chapter 5 and verse 2, when Esther came before Ahasuerus uninvited. So Esther drew near, it says, in Esther 5 verse 2, and touched the top of the scepter. Touch connected her with her king. They were united as one in that moment of understanding. So when Christ chose to touch people, he was demonstrating that he identified and associated with their need. He participated in their weakness. He was connected to the people that he had come to save. He was a participant of the same human race. Well, the third way in which touch is used is to represent. You'll remember the story of the scapegoat on the Day of Atonement. Leviticus 16 and verse 21 and Aaron, it says, shall lay both his hands upon the head of the live goat and confess over him all the iniquities of the children of Israel and all their transgressions and all their sins, putting them upon the head of the goat. Touch was all about representation. The touch of the high priest placed the sins of the people onto the head of the goat symbolically. So when Christ chose to touch, he was proving to the people that he was one with them. He was their representative. They could see in him the antitypical animal upon whose head the congregation would one day lay their hands and he would take away their sins. 
when they touched, they were united and he could redeem them. And lastly, the fourth way in which touch is used in the scriptures is to bring blessing. Isaiah 6 and verse 7, when Isaiah was touched by the seraphim with a live coal from the altar, it says, And he laid it upon my mouth and said, Lo, this hath touched thy lips, and thine iniquity is taken away, and thy sin purged. Touch brought the blessing of forgiveness. So when Christ chose to touch, he was trying to reach out and bless, to guide, to sanctify by his presence. His touch likewise brought forgiveness and healing and life. So these are the four reasons why he was always touching his people, connecting with them to cleanse or to bring the opposite of defilement, to connect, to represent, and to bless. This was how everybody felt like they belonged to him. How they knew that they were his. Do you know in Luke chapter 4 and verse 40, we're told that at the end of the Sabbath, as the sun was going down, everybody in Capernaum, Everybody in Capernaum brought their sick to the door of where Jesus Christ was staying. And it says that he touched and healed every one of them. Luke 4 verse 40. They all had a personal, meaningful connection with Jesus Christ. They were all touched because they were all his sheep. And do you know, young people, it's essential that we are touched as well. Maybe not literally, physically, but we've got to be touched in our hearts by this man. It's essential if he's to be our savior. There has to be a connection. This is what um, Brother W.F. Barling says in his book, Jesus, Teacher and Healer. On the necessity of touch, he came both to bind up the brokenhearted and conversely to bring out the prisoners from the prison. The binding and bringing were made manifest by outward physical acts, his acts of healing. But if they were parabolic, so also we can be sure was the physical contact between the diseased and himself, which normally accompanied the performance of them. Like his baptism, it hinted at the necessity for some radical connection between him and them before he, the sinless, could save them, the sinful. It did not suffice that he should be sinless, indispensable though that was. Somehow, contact had to be established between his spotlessness and their defilement before one could become efficacious for the removal of the other. So touch, physical contact, was necessary to link the healer with the healed. There would be a bond between the sufferer and the man who had come to alleviate their suffering. You'll remember the words of Hebrews 4 and verse 15. We don't need to turn it up because you all probably know those words so well. He was touched with the feelings of our infirmities. He demonstrated that sharing of our struggles by reaching out and connecting physically with the sufferers, he showed that he was one with them. He was one of them in every way, in all points, tempted like as we are, yet without sin. He was a man who was amongst the people that he came to save touched their lives with hands that looked like their lives, worn, overworked, gnarled with the problems of life, the hands that were furrowed and creased with the toil of the hard labor that was the result of Adam's sin. He came to share their weakness that he might lend them his father's strength. His hands embodied their lives and he was constantly amongst them. 
And do you know, young people, Isaiah, which we just had read for us, is going to share the secret of this connection between the Redeemer and the redeemed by using the same metaphors in Isaiah 53 to describe disease and suffering and sin itself. So come back, if you will, to our reading for tonight, which was Isaiah and chapter 53. And see if you can't see how Isaiah, under inspiration, is going to show to us just how connected Christ was to us touched with the feeling of our infirmities. Now we read in verse 3 that Jesus Christ was destined to be despised, rejected of men, a man of sorrows, and acquainted with grief. And we hid, as it were, our faces from him. He was despised, and we esteemed him not. You might not know that that word grief in Isaiah 53 and verse 3 probably should be best translated as sickness. In fact, that's how the revised version margin translates the word grief. And in actual fact, 20 out of the 24 times that it's used in the Old Testament, it's translated sick sickness or disease. So I think that we can be pretty confident that this is perhaps a better translation of the word. He was a man acquainted with sicknesses. Acquainted with sicknesses. And yet, when we read verse 4, we find that they weren't his own. Surely he hath borne our griefs. And the revised version margin has sicknesses again. He's carried our sorrows, yet we did esteem him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. The servant of this chapter was a man who was intimately acquainted with our sicknesses. He bore our sorrows. He was inextricably linked to us as our representative. And the reason why these verses are so important is because he bore our sicknesses, young people, to identify with us. Despite our ungratefulness. Did you see in both of those verses, verse 3 and 4, we esteemed him not. He was connected to us despite us hiding our face from him at times, despite our despisings. See, the thing is, young people, that when we look at Jesus Christ, the very fact that he bore our sicknesses makes him look weak, frail, ordinary. He was despised because he didn't look any different to any of us, to any of the people that he was helping and touching and healing. He likewise got tired. He also had a sore back and sore feet after a long day. He was touched with the feeling of our infirmities. and Because he looked just the same as us, ordinary, we esteemed him stricken, smitten of God, and afflicted. He was stricken. Now, do you know that that word stricken in verse 4, in that word, Isaiah makes an unmistakable allusion back to the law of (coughs) leprosy in Leviticus. Because the word stricken is the Hebrew root word nagar, and it's the root of the word that occurs over 60 times In just two chapters in Leviticus 13 and 14, the chapters on the plague of leprosy. So it should really be, we esteemed him plagued. Even though the plagues that he bore were ours, he bore our sicknesses, we counted him as plagued. Can you see the irony of human nature and our ingratitude? 
you know, we know that Isaiah's mind is in Leviticus 13 and 14 because he's going to say, or he's going to, sorry, use the exact word for plague from Leviticus 13 and 14 in verse 8. For the transgression of my people was he stricken. It should really be plagued. This is actually the only time out of 78 occurrences that it's translated stricken. It's always translated plagued. So he was perfect, young people, but he bore our plagues. His affliction was not deserved. He was without sin, but he graciously bore it for the good of others. He suffered for them. He was stricken on their behalf, connected to them by the sicknesses that he bore for them. And so in verse 5, Isaiah is going to deftly mix his metaphors so we get the point. Look what he says in verse 5. But he was wounded for our transgressions. He was bruised for our iniquities. And the chastisement of our peace was upon him. And with his stripes, we are healed. He bore our transgressions and iniquities so that we might receive not forgiveness, but healing from our sicknesses. See how Isaiah, under inspiration, merges sickness with sin and healing with forgiveness from iniquity. So each act of healing was like a parable of redemption. It was like a mini redemption in anticipation of the sacrifice by which that redemption would come. Each touch was the touch that looked forward to the ultimate cure. Each laying on of Christ's hands looked forward to the piercing of those hands by which ultimate health and forgiveness and life would come. So can you see what Isaiah is saying in Isaiah 53? There's an undeniable connection between sin and sickness. Sin was the cause and sickness was the effect. And our master came to heal us from both. And as he went about touching and curing and empathizing with the people, he was taking on their sicknesses and bearing their sins, becoming at one with them. And just as God laid on him our sicknesses, verse 4, he bore them. God also laid on him in verse 6 the iniquity of us all, our sins, and he bore them too. He was intimately connected with the people he had come to save. And now, let me show you how the same verse in Isaiah 53 is quoted and interpreted by two different apostles in two different ways to show this connection between sickness and sin. It's Isaiah 53 in verse 4. Surely he hath borne our griefs and carried our sorrows. Do you know when that verse is quoted by Matthew, this is how he quotes it in Matthew chapter 8, verse 16 and 17. And he cast out the spirits with his word and healed all them that were sick, that it might be fulfilled which was spoken by Isaiah the prophet, saying, himself took our infirmities and bore our sicknesses. But do you know when the same verse is quoted in 1 of Peter chapter 2 and verse 24, Peter says, who his own self bear our sins in his own body on the tree, that we being dead to sins should live unto righteousness by whose stripes ye were healed, which is a connection to the next verse in Isaiah and chapter 53. <clears throat> so when it says in Peter that he bore our sins, and we understand that to be that he was able to represent sinners, that's absolutely correct, by the way. 
there could also be another way in which our Lord Jesus Christ bore our griefs, bore our sins, bore our sicknesses. Maybe there was a literal, practical, everyday way in which he bore our sins, and that was that he touched and reached out and healed sick people. He bore our sicknesses, says Matthew chapter 8. So our sickness and our sin are linked together inextricably. And when Christ touched and healed, he was connected not only to sick people, but to sinners. And each healing, each miraculous cure was a foretaste of the greater healing that was only possible by his death. This is what um, Brother Barling goes on to say in his book, Healer and Teacher. When sick men and women thronged Jesus, touched him, and obtained immediate healing as a result, they unconsciously fulfilled that prophecy. Yahweh hath laid on him the iniquities of us all. The only difference when Jesus himself took the initiative in coming into physical contact with them was that he fulfilled the prophecy consciously and with full understanding of its awful physical, not to mention spiritual implications for himself. Only by himself suffering could he restore sufferers to soundness in the ultimate and complete sense. For those who benefited from his miracles, their cure was a cause for joy. But for him, it was a cause of foreboding. For in the final issue, none could be healed except at the cost of his stripes. A sense of foreboding. Everything depended on his willing and perfect sacrifice, without which every healing, every touched life, every changed heart would all be in vain. And I think, young people, I think that in our Heavenly Father's wisdom, the power of touch was a subtle but powerful reminder of this fact for Christ himself. Because I think that with each touch, where spirit power flowed out of his body and people were healed, it took its toll on his body. The hand that extended health, expended it at the same time. It depleted him. Contact with him drained him of physical strength. Each healing was a daily physical reminder in his body of his upcoming sacrifice. Look at these three passages. The cost of the touch of Jesus of Nazareth. Because I think that it appears when we read the gospel records uh, carefully that each touch of the master involved a loss of energy or spirit from him. We read this in Luke chapter 5. And it came to pass on a certain day as he was teaching that there were Pharisees and doctors of the law sitting by, which were come out of every town of Galilee and Judea and Jerusalem. And the power of the Lord was present to heal them. What does that phrase mean? Well, I think it probably means that whoever touched Jesus Christ in that moment, by their faith, they were healed. Because look what we read in Luke chapter 6. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for there went virtue out of him and healed them all. And you'll remember in Luke chapter 8, the story of the woman with the issue of blood. And Jesus said, somebody hath touched me, for I perceive that virtue is gone out of me. We can't be sure if that same virtue or energy drained out of him when he healed just by a word, but it certainly seems to when he touches people. And I think that it was our Father's daily reminder. You are bearing their sicknesses, but also their iniquities. 
And as he healed young people, guess what? He got older, weaker, frail before his time. It was a daily reminder of his mission to sacrifice himself for the desperate needs of his people. And vitality would ebb from his body at each healing. Maybe when it says in Hebrews 4 and verse 15 that he, he was touched. Did you notice, by the way, that it doesn't say touched with our infirmities? It says touched with the feeling of our infirmities. And maybe one way that he felt our infirmities was when he felt the draining of his virtue go out of his body. He felt not just the emotional feelings of our sicknesses, but their physical impact. He was aging before his time. Each time he healed, he gave and he was depleted. His virtue went out to heal their vice. When it says that he poured out his soul unto death, it wasn't just on the cross, young people, that he did that. It was throughout his entire ministry. Every day, he poured out his soul unto death. Do you remember what the Jews said in astonishment in John 8 and verse 57? Thou art not yet 50 years old. And hast thou seen Abraham? It appears that Jesus looked more like a 50-year-old than a 30-year-old. He had aged before his time, constantly giving to the people, had sapped him of youth and virility. And maybe that's what Isaiah meant in Isaiah 52 and verse 14, just earlier in the servant song where God said, many were astonished at him. His visage was marred more than any man and his form more than the sons of men. And at the start of chapter 53 and verse 2, he hath no form or comeliness. When we see him, there is no beauty that we should desire him. Jesus Christ, young people, looked old. He looked tired. He looked sick himself. Perhaps that's why some said in Luke 4 verse 23, physician, heal thyself. His natural powers were relentlessly sapped by the voracious crowds who clamored for his energy and drained him of his powers so that when he went to the cross, young people, he was a shell of a man, spent, exhausted, fatigued. And when on the cross, he cried out with a loud voice, it's finished. It wasn't just that all the prophecies of the Old Testament could be ticked off in his mind. It's because he actually had nothing left to give. He'd carried the sicknesses of the world, the sins of the world upon his shoulders, and he could carry them no further. He could carry the cross no more, completely spent at age 33 and a half a complete sacrifice, a witness to doing his father's will. And on Golgotha, he would lift up his hands one last time in the final act of obedience, crucifixion. He would spend and be spent. How does this motivate us, brothers and sisters and young people? Our redemption came at enormous cost to our master. Not just because he gave his life on the cross, which would clearly be enough, but because he gave his life every day, drained for the needs of others, touching the people that he came to save. What an inspirational life. What an inspirational man. What an example to try to follow. So in conclusion tonight, I want to ask ourselves one question as we consider the way in which Jesus of Nazareth touched people's lives. And the question I want to ask is this. Are we touched? Do we feel connected to Jesus Christ? Do you, 
young person feel attached to him. Because if we want to be his people, if we want to belong to him, to our shepherd, our master, we have to allow him to touch us. And we have to reach out and connect with him. He alone is the source of healing and life. How easy is it to connect to the world? How easy is it to connect to everything that's out there online? To be connected to everything that doesn't really matter and to be unconnected, disconnected from our master. You don't need to to tell me how difficult this is, but this is the challenge of our series together this week. We've got to stay close. We've got to bring ourselves close to him, to press upon him if we are to be his people and to be touched by his hands. This is the challenge of this series together, to allow ourselves to be touched by him, to be connected to him before anything else in our lives, and to follow his example, to be touched by his love. So what do we hope to cover in our series, God willing, in the next few days? Well, tonight we've just had an introduction on the importance of touch, the way in which Christ bore our sickness and disease away and was connected with his people. But you see, sin and disease and suffering and a desperate need for healing and redemption were not and are not just Jewish problems. They are universal problems. And we ought not to be surprised to find that Jesus is able to change the lives of both Jews and and Gentiles, thankfully for ourselves. And we're going to find that often, not always, but often, the times where Jesus Christ reaches out and touches come in pairs. So over this week, we want to look at four pairs of people. The leper and Peter's wife's mother, touching the hopeless from Matthew chapter 8. We want to look from Mark chapter 7 at the deaf and dumb man and the blind man. How Christ was able to reach out and touch the helpless. We want to look at how he touched the powerless in Luke 8, the woman with the issue of blood and Jairus' daughter. And lastly, we want to look at Mary, Magdalene and Thomas reaching out and touching the faithless in John chapter 20. These are very real issues that we face and very real feelings that we feel. And God willing, we will find in each of these coupled stories the same lesson, but put twice in the record. One person will type for us the Jews and the other the Gentiles, and our master can touch the lives of both. So that's what lies ahead of us this week, the lives of eight people, four couplets of people that Jesus physically touched from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Eight different circumstances, four different needs, and yet one master, one pair of hands, one objective to seek out and to save the broken, the lost, the unclean, the forgotten, those whose lives were battered and scarred and all out of tune, and to lift them up and make them instruments of praise and glory to his Father, to save them by the touch of the Master's hand. Now, we have a very beautiful hymn, which I'd barely sung in my life, but I want to read it for you as we close tonight. It's the one that we'll close with together. Hymn 407, but... Just listen to its words and see how beautiful they express what we've talked about this evening. At even, ere the sun was set, the sick, O Lord, around thee lay. Oh, in what divers pains they met. 
but with what joy they went away. Once more, tis even tide, and we, oppressed with various ills, draw near. What if thy form we cannot see? We know and feel that thou art here. O Saviour Christ, our woes dispel, for some are sick and some are sad, and some have never loved thee well, and some have lost the love they had. O Saviour Christ, thou too art man. Thou hast been troubled, tempted, tried. Thy kind but searching glance can scan the very wounds that shame would hide. Thy touch has still its ancient power. No word from thee can fruitless fall. Here, in this solemn evening hour, and in thy mercy, heal us all. Thanks very much for an incredible opening study, Uncle Nathan. I think it's really fascinating the role touch places in our lives, physical contact with those around us, and then to see how Christ reaches out and touches us and so that we can have that relationship. I found that so compelling. And then that final question, do we feel connected to our Lord Jesus Christ? Well, I'm really looking forward to tomorrow's class and continuing these studies over the next week. We'll close tonight's study then, as our brother Nathan mentioned, through hymn and prayer and then announcements from Mitch. And our closing hymn is hymn 407, followed by a prayer through Josh Kempster.
dear Father, creator of the universe and the one who has formed each of us with the care of a potter. We have felt the emotion that your son brought to the earth, the joy of sin forgiven and sickness healed, as well as the toll that was taken on those beautiful hands. We do not know what those hands appeared like, only that they bear the marks of our sins indelibly left as a connection to us. We don't know what our Lord looked like, his hands, his face, or the sound of his voice, but we know he was a beautiful man because we know his character. With every touch, he gave his all to others, to exhaustion. And we wish to feel the touch of our Lord, to share a room with him, to be in his presence and know that he brings your presence too. Thank you for giving your son for the time we've had to stop and consider your love and the love of your son. And to do that with hundreds of people here. Last year we could not gather because we could not touch. But now we have so many brothers and sisters present and young people and friends. Please help us to reach out to others, to follow the example of our Lord and be present with whatever our brothers, sisters, friends and all sinners need, whether a touch or a word or something else. Help us to be your fingers working on earth to prepare the way of our Lord. We long for that day above all else. And we offer this prayer through our Lord and compassionate High Priest. Amen. Well, good evening, everyone, and welcome to End of Year Studies 2022. A very warm welcome also to those who join us from interstate and those also viewing our studies on the live stream. It's an amazing blessing, as Josh mentioned, uh, from our Heavenly Father to meet together in these kinds of numbers. It's something that we've uh, not been able to, to do, especially with Nathan. It's been a while coming, um, so we're looking forward to that, and let's not take that for granted. We want to thank Brother Nathan for his uh, first study, and we also want to thank Sam, Isaac, Cora and Josh. Special thank you to uh, Brother Nathan, uh, Sister Susanna, um, and also welcome to their three children, Mariah, Hebron and Olivet from Christchurch, New Zealand. W welcome to Adelaide, um, and you've been greeted by some of our finest weather. Hopefully it cools down as the week progresses. We look forward to getting to know you all better um, and having an encouraging and uplifting time together. Um, now, in the event of an emergency, as Sam mentioned, um, we all need to meet on the oval to your left, um, and you'll find the toilets on your left as you exit the main hall. And in the event of a medical emergency, our first aid officers are Natalie Elton and Ashley Lund. Now, the Taste and See Cafe will be open after each study to meet your uh, your coffee needs, I guess. There's heaps of ice cold drinks, coffee, juice and smoothies, and chips are only $1. Uh, please make your order inside to uh, my right, and then move outside to collect your order. Uh, please consume food and drinks outside, please. And the cafe's preferred method of payment is by a card. Study two. Um, it um, will be tomorrow starting at 10.30 a.m. Uh, Brother Nathan will be speaking about touching the hopeless. To chair is Steve Cadeau. To play the piano is Sarah Steele. The reader is Jamie Gibson. And to close in prayer is Ty Hillian. After the study tomorrow, we were planning, planning on having uh, the family picnic on the bottom oval. However, the forecasted temperature of 40 degrees is looking pretty ugly. So we've decided to cancel the sports outing and meet afterwards at the Hazelwood Reserve after the study. That's going to be starting from 1 p.m. Uh, where we'll have a barbecue um, and a swim at the pool there. So please bring $10 for the pool um, and a few more dollars for sausages, cans and ice creams. And later on that evening, there will be an AYC uh, supper uh, 
AYC fundraising supper for the young people, um, and we ask the young people to please check um, their, the AYC Instagram page or see Elliot and Cora for further details. Now, on New Year's Eve, the 31st of December, we're going to be having a young people's outing, and that is going to be at Carrick Hill from 11 a.m. until 2 p.m. And we want all the young people to come dressed up to the theme of vintage country club sports. Uh, make of that what you will. Uh, there will be a cost of $15. Uh, so we ask all the young people to mark that day in their diaries uh, for an uh, exciting end of year's outing. And more information about that will be on Instagram as well. Just a few other general announcements. The Faith Alive magazine has kindly given us some copies of their latest edition here at End of Year Studies. Uh, please grab a copy as you walk out the hall. If you have also just got off the waiting list for Adelaide Youth Conference, please see Josh Kempster to get your notes or pick them up as you exit. And the School of the Prophets will be at the Hebron campsite from Saturday the 7th of January to Friday the 13th. Uh, that's definitely a camp for all the young lads to try and get to. Um, so please go and see Uncle Pete Tritola or Uncle Tim Badger after this study to grab a booking form. Thank you for attending study one and we look forward to seeing you tomorrow morning at study two. Thank you.